Okay, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you. I, as you know, I'm away most of the semester in a so-called sabbatical, but uh, I, I, this was too enticing an occasion to, to be away, and so I'm extremely pleased to introduce uh, Professor Jan Golinski uh, today, who's a professor of history and humanities at the University of uh, New Hampshire, where he's also a chair uh, of the Department of History. I think he's almost at the end of, uh, <laughs> of this, and he has endured enough. Um, is, I mean, as you know well, uh, Professor Golinski is, is a central figure in our field, and his work has been focusing mostly on 18th century uh, and the long 18th century and, and Britain. And, and I think overall his, his work has been quite emblematic of the transformations of the field in the last 20 years, and, and I mean this in a, in a good sense. Uh, he's, he's the author of uh, a number of books and articles, and I'll just mention Science as Public Culture, Chemistry and, and Enlightenment in Britain, that goes back to 1992, Making Natural Knowledge, Constructivism and the History of Science, which is, has been called the Bible of Social Constructivism and is compulsory reading for our graduate students uh, as well as many others. Uh, and he co-edited um, a, a volume entitled the Sciences in Enlightened Europe, which for the specialist of uh, 18th century history of science is very much a kind of an iconic collection. And more recently, he published with Chicago University Press, British Weather and the Climate of Enlightenment, which is a culmination of a series of pioneering works in, and contributions um, that explore the historicity of weather and how ideas of climate actually changed, especially in the uh, 18th century. Um, I think that the talk today is not immediately related to this particular project, but it, it is, 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 is closer to the, um, the, the issue of, public, of uh, public culture and science. And uh, I'll just uh, leave the floor to Professor Golinski. Thank you very much, and try to put this somewhere. Yeah, I Thank you. So I'm wondering where, where is the computer went away. Yeah. <laughs> <Goodness>. <laughs> All right, there we go. It's coming back. Well, it's great to be back at Berkeley. It's great to see some old friends, <laughs> including some I really had not expected to be here. Um, uh, uh, Professor Heilbrunn presided over the very first occasion on which I gave any professional presentation, which was here at Berkeley in uh, 1981 or 82, I think it was. And I distinctly remember that um, as I threatened to overrun my time, he stood up <laughs> in the audience to send the signal that I'd talked long enough. <laughs> so, so, great to see him again. Uh, and um, so, yeah, this um, uh, uh, is kind of a standalone topic. Uh, it's related to uh, the themes of uh, public science in the 18th century, the culture of scientific display and demonstration uh, in that period. Um, uh, and I'm um, trying to connect uh, some of the issues surrounding that topic with aesthetics uh, in the 18th century. So, um, let's uh, start with this. On uh, 19th December 1785, the Reverend James Woodford, who was vicar of Western Longville in Norfolk in the east of England, rode into the city of Norwich with a friend. Entering a pub in the city, he witnessed a display by the learned pig. Uh, the pig was apparently able to spell out words or answers to numerical questions by indicating cards placed in front of him. He was a star performer of the circus impresario Philip Astley, who was touring him around the English provinces in the 1780s, uh, the start of what has been called his stellar career. 
That's to say the pig's stellar career, not Astley's. Woodford paid one shilling to see this show, and then, to quote from his journal, I walked about town and paid several bills and then walked to the assembly rooms near Chapel Field and heard an excellent lecture on astronomy, etc., spoken by one Walker with a view of his Iduranion, or transparent orrery. Was highly pleased with it. A great deal of company present. I paid two shillings and sixpence. Okay. Now, I don't have anything more to say about the learned pig, except to show you this picture of his performance. Um, my topic is the other show that uh, Woodford saw on that occasion, the Idoranion, or Transparent Orrery, used to le illustrate the lecture on astronomy. I want to try and explain what this thing was, at least as far as the available evidence allows, and to introduce the one walker whom Woodford heard lecture on it. The conjunction with the learned pig is intriguing, uh, but quite possibly misleading. In some ways, the Idoranion offered a comparable kind of entertainment to those who came to see it. But as Woodford's remarks indicate, it was also thought to provide a rather superior kind of edification. The Norfolk vicar found the lecture on astronomy, etc., highly pleasing, and he, along with the rest of his audience, was willing to pay more than twice as much to see it. Now, this Norwich lecturer was, in fact, the inventor of the Idoranion, Adam Walker. Um, uh, he was responsible for making this apparatus, and in a sense, it was also the making of him. He became one of the most successful scientific lecturers in Britain in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, and he had two sons who followed in his footsteps. His case allows us to explore some of the links between public science and aesthetics in this period, specifically the invocation of the sublime in a scientific context. Walker's Iduranion was frequently referred to by himself and by others as conveying a sense of the sublime in connection with astronomy. This became a constant refrain in commentary on the apparatus and its presentation. I want to try and understand why spectators described their experience in this way, what it was about the Idoranion and how it was shown that evoked this sense of the sublime. I'm not really aiming to contribute to the history of aesthetic ideas. My interest is not in the systematic treatment of the term in learned discourse, but rather its casual use in connection with scientific lectures. There were certainly resonances with talk of the sublime in other contexts, in relations to works of art or scenic landscapes, for example. But I'm not going to try to elicit a single consistent meaning behind all the deployments of the term. Instead, my argument will be that the use of what was by this point a commonplace word both revealed and concealed aspects of the experience of those who attended Walker's displays. It revealed its connections to other kinds of spectatorship, for example, in the theater, or when watching scenes of nature, when the passions and the intellect were engaged. But at the same time, it concealed some of the implications of the underlying ideas, including those that were potentially challenging to religious orthodoxy. The use of the term sublime in connection with Walker's lectures thus facilitated his personal journey between two rather different social worlds, the English provincial enlightenment, where he began, and the more culturally conservative climate of the Regency metropolis, where he ended up. The techniques he developed to give his audiences a taste of the astronomical sublime allowed him to make this transition successfully and moderately smoothly. So let me talk first about uh, the social dimensions of Walker's career. And his career trajectory was indeed quite a remarkable one. He was a native of the Lake District in the far northwest of England, born, as you can see, either in 1730 or 1731, in a very small village, Patterdale, in Westmoreland. His father was in the woolen textile trade, and the young Walker had very little formal education. He mostly taught himself, 
while working as an assistant teacher at schools in Yorkshire and Cheshire. In the early 1760s, he was running a school in Manchester, teaching writing, geography, and arithmetic. His first publication was a primer on family bookkeeping, but he also began giving public lectures on astronomy at this time. By 1766, he had married and returned to Westmoreland to the village of Kirkland, where his oldest son, William, was born. At this point, he gave up school teaching and embarked on the career of an itinerant scientific lecturer, publishing the first edition of his lecture syllabus at Kendall. He also purchased apparatus for philosophical and astronomical display from a man called William Griffiths, or Griffith, a lecturer who had been working his way around the towns of the Midlands and the southwest of England during the previous two or three decades. Having acquired this apparatus, Walker took to the road for several years, travel, traveling in northern England and Scotland and residing for four years in Ireland while delivering courses of lectures on natural philosophy and astronomy. By 1773, he settled in York and was beginning to include in his repertoire Joseph Priestley's recent discoveries of new gases. Five years later, he visited Priestley in London and was given pneumatic apparatus to use in his displays. After Priestley moved to Birmingham, Walker visited the town in 1781 and gave a series of lectures with Matthew Bolton, Samuel Galton, and other members of the Lunar Society in attendance. Walker moved to London later that year settling there with his wife, three sons, and one daughter in a house in Hanover Square. This uh, portrait is by George Romney, this group portrait from the mid-1790s. Uh, here's the patriarch, uh, Adam Walker. Uh, he, next to him, his daughter, uh, Eliza, uh, his wife, uh, Eleanor, and his sons uh, from uh, the left, uh, William, the oldest, Adam John, who never had any interest in the lecturing business, and then the youngest, Dean Franklin Walker, who did, in fact, follow in his father's footsteps. Uh, the Walker household was the scene of m some of the meetings of the Coffee House Philosophical Society in the mid-1780s, uh, demonstrating Walker's significant connections with some of the leading men of science in the capital. He continued to travel occasionally but most of his work was now done in London, giving private courses of lectures at his house while he or one of his sons taught astronomy publicly in such venues as the Theatre Royal, Haymarket. He also lectured at the major public schools, including Eton, where the young Percy Shelley witnessed his performance. He inducted his sons, William Walker and Dean Franklin Walker, into the lecturing trade, but William uh, the oldest one there, predeceased his father in 1816, uh, and it was Dean Franklin Walker who was left to carry on the family tradition when Adam Walker himself died in 1821. Now, the connection with Priestley is, I think, a crucial one uh, in defining Walker's career. The evidence is that Walker shared much of Priestley's philosophy of public enlightenment, in his System of Familiar Philosophy of 1799, Walker wrote that it was the business of science to dispel the darkness of ignorance by opening the book of nature to rational inquiry. He acknowledged that, quote, philosophy has of late been branded as the cause of mischief by those whose interest it is to promote ignorance and slavery in the world. But he insisted that, quote, there is no inquiry whatsoever more calculated to inspire every good disposition of the heart or more rationally wean the mind from narrow and confining prejudices. Now, by the late 1790s, these were no anodyne sentiments. Walker was throwing in his lot with those who continued to uphold the values of the Enlightenment, even after such conservative writers as Edmund Burke had lambasted liberal intellectuals for provoking the violence and upheaval of the French Revolution. The rising tide of reaction had already driven, driven Priestley himself into exile in the United States. 
Walker gives an interesting account of a journey he took from London to the Lake District in 1791, uh, and he records having passed through Birmingham shortly before the riots in which a loyalist mob attacked the homes of Priestley and other dissenters. Alas, Walker bewailed, why should ingenuity and science be yet contaminated with the illiberal alloy of bigotry and intolerance? Walker's loyalty to Priestley ran deep, in other words. In the late 1770s, he had hailed Priestley's discovery of a test to measure the purity of air as a vital contribution to public health. By locating the sources of foul and unhealthy air, Priestley's test encouraged the ventilation of city streets, dwellings, hospitals, ships, and factories. Priestley had also discovered a gas that was even purer than normal air, his so-called deflogisticated air, which we know as oxygen. Walker saw this as promising new therapies to replace the irrational healing practices of the past. So Priestley's pneumatic chemistry offered Walker a vision of the power of scientific knowledge to liberate human beings from disease and from the tyranny of ignorance and superstition. The connection with Priestley had a further importance for Walker in that Priestley had worked out in some detail how to enlist the aesthetic instincts of his audiences to communicate science to the public. Priestley's interest in uh, the role of experimental demonstrations in general enlightenment originally developed in the 1760s in connection with the phenomena of electricity. In his preface to the history and present state of electricity in 1767, Priestley wrote that the pleasure of studying science resembles that of the sublime, which is one of the most exquisite of all those that affect the human imagination. A reviewer of the volume noted that the author's description of the Leiden jar was written, quote, under the influence of the surprise and terror excited by a new and unexpected feeling of a most peculiar kind. The Leiden jar, it seemed, delivered not only a physical shock from an electric discharge, but also a kind of aesthetic shock, an exquisite surprise and terror identified with the feeling of the sublime. And as Jessica Riskin, Simon Schaffer, Paolo Bertucci, and others have shown, the Leiden jar assumed a central role in the public culture of display that mobilized the passions of its audience as it enlisted them in experimental practice. Priestley continued to be interested in this issue of the aesthetic feelings evoked by scientific demonstrations when he turned to pneumatic chemistry in the 1770s. Experimental demonstrations of new gases were interpreted as sublime in two senses. First, the displays were revealing powers of nature that elicited emotions of wonder and astonishment in human spectators. And second, the revelation of these powers at this time was part of the historical process of enlightenment, which, for Priestley, was itself a sublime prospect. Thus, he celebrated as sublime and glorious the vision of an indefinite continuation of scientific research, endlessly pushing back the boundaries of darkness and ignorance. In the first volume of his experiments and observations on different kinds of air in 1774, Priestley quoted a passage from Alexander Pope's essay on criticism about climbing in the Alps, where as each peak is surmounted, further vistas appear for contemplation and further peaks to be conquered. In the same way, Priestley claimed, the history of experimental science offered a more inspiring spectacle than the messy and contingent history of human society because it manifested a steady, providentially guaranteed progress toward general enlightenment. So as Priestley said, the spectacle of the progress of the sciences, quote, bears a considerable resemblance to that of the sublime. Now, in using this term sublime, 
Uh, Priestley was obliquely evoking the most influential discussion of this term in English in the period, which was Edmund Burke's philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful, published in 1757. For Burke, the sublime was defined by astonishment. And astonishment, Burke said, is that state of the soul in which all its motions are suspended with some degree of horror. Terrifying things were sublime for Burke, provided they were viewed from a certain distance, obviously. Dangerous animals, the ocean, darkness, or vast spaces. More generally, any fearsome display of the powers of nature could produce the requisite state of astonishment and suspended terror. Earthquakes, thunder, even the light of the sun were also sources of the sublime. In such cases, Burke noted, the mind is so entirely filled with its object that it cannot entertain any other. Now, Priestley presumably knew of Burke's treatment of the sublime, but he didn't exactly mention it in his own discussion of the topic in his course of lectures on oratory and criticism of 1762. Priestley presented a more complacent treatment of the subject than Burke's. For Priestley, the sublime was identified with elevation of the mind to contemplate superior things. Uh, and Priestley detached the sublime from the feelings of fear or apprehension of pain, thereby arguably discarding the most radical and innovative aspect of Burke's analysis. Though Priestley retained the same list of the kinds of things that were regarded as sublime, uh, the same as, uh, list as Burke's. For Priestley, the experience of the sublime was a positive one, but it was distinct from straightforward pleasure. It was caused by sensations that, quote, relate to great objects, suppose extensive views of things, require a great effort of mind to conceive them, and produce great effects. Even darkness and silence, if they fix the attention and still the mind, might therefore partake of the sublime. Priestley noted that authors who invoked the sublime were more likely to be admired and remembered than those who merely aimed to please, since they, uh, the former, represent nature in the grandest and noblest point of light. And Priestley specifically mentioned the sciences of astronomy and natural philosophy as tending, quote, to exhibit the noblest fields of the sublime that the mind of man was ever introduced to. So Walker uh, uh, adopted from Priestley this uh, kind of resonance of the term uh, sublime and mentioned the term frequently in uh, his own public lectures. Exposure to that which was intrinsically grand and noble was supposed to have an uplifting effect. Walker shared Priestley's views about the providential character of scientific discoveries and the moral value of public education. He lauded the rational knowledge of God that came from the study of nature, and he praised his audiences for their sensibility and politeness in recognizing this. From the earliest editions of his lecture syllabus, Walker was promising the men and women who attended that they would experience the most rational and sublime parts of knowledge, in particular through the study of astronomy. His apparatus was said to be appropriate to convey to the mind the most sublime instruction. The lecturer's role, Walker insisted, was simply to open the book of nature before his audience, Nature itself, the cosmos at large, was the sublime force that would work its moral effect with minimum rhetorical mediation. As the European magazine noted in a review of Walker's career in 1792, the simple but animated manner in which these sublime ideas are explained is one of Walker's first merits. So this was the uh, aesthetic uh, vocabulary that Walker was deploying to describe what he was doing. And he complemented this with specific technical means, namely the Iduranion.
the Iduranion was the apparatus he constructed to communicate to his audience the sublimity of the cosmos. There were several versions of this apparatus, uh, and I'll show you a couple of visual depictions of it, uh, but I should explain right away uh, that there is no precise specification of how this worked, uh, and I do not know exactly how it worked. Essentially, it was a vertical orrery, and as the descriptions insisted, a transparent orrery. Now, an orrery, of course, as we know, uh, is a mechanical device using gearing and moving parts to replicate the motions of the sun, moon, earth, and other planets of the solar system. Uh, this is a very well-known depiction of an orrery uh, by Joseph Wright from the 1760s, uh, in which we see that this is essentially a tabletop apparatus displayed in small public or domestic gatherings, uh, such as this scene in which family members are gathered around. Uh, such a demonstration. The crucial innovation of tilting the plane of the orrery into the vertical allowed it to be seen by a much larger audience. Made sufficiently large, it could be mounted in the proscenium of a theatre and viewed by an audience of hundreds. This is the first uh, picture that we have of the Iduranion, uh, perhaps in the old Theatre Royal in Haymarket. Walker apparently had some uh, such apparatus already in the 1770s and there are hints that there could have been precursors in the repertoire of some earlier public lecturers like Benjamin Martin or James Ferguson. Uh, we know that a version that was said to be 15 feet in diameter was made for him by William Allen, a Birmingham instrument maker otherwise known for his electrical machines. A uh, subsequent version was said to be, have been 20 feet or more in diameter. The mechanism was transparent in the sense that the planets and their satellites moved without visible means of support. One suggestion for how this thing worked was that the, uh, the uh, planets were mounted on circular plates which moved in grooves around uh, corresponding to their orbits. The planets themselves were said to be represented by illuminated glass globes, though it's not clear whether they were illuminated from behind or somehow from within. Uh, they rotated in their orbits against a dark background, conveying the effect of heavenly bodies moving unsupported through empty space. Now, I have a few more words to say about the way in which the thing might have been constructed a bit later, and we can discuss that. There's another important aspect of the Iduranion, which uh, I think is worth talking about, and that's its name. Walker christened his apparatus in December 1781, a decision that surely owed something to the sensational display in London in February of that year of the similarly named Idufusicon. The Idu Physicon was the project of the Strasbourg-born artist and theatrical designer Philippe de Luthorbourg, who had been brought over from Paris to work on the staging of David Garrick's productions at Drury Lane. Luthorbourg was credited with considerable improvements in scenery, painting, and lighting, bringing to the London stage dramatic effects pioneered by his Parisian employer, the theatrical and fireworks impresario Giovanni Serrandoni. <coughs> Luthorberg's I do Physicon presented in miniature an enhanced version of the theatrical experience. It used effects like those in its creator's stage designs and it drew a comparable degree of attention. This is the I do Physicon. You can see what it was. Essentially, it is an illuminated box about 10 feet wide, 6 feet high, and 8 feet deep, placed in front of rows of seats uh, in a darkened room. Within the box, viewers see cutouts and models moving without apparent cause and brilliantly lit to portray different scenes. These included landscapes, cities, battles, 
a shipwreck at sea, and finally, shown in this uh, illustration, the scene of Satan mustering his armies from Milton's Paradise Lost. Lighting for the Physicon was provided by the recently invented argon oil lamps and by colored filters adjusted to change in hue and intensity to represent dawn, sunset, moonlight, and strokes of lightning. The visual scene was accompanied by harpsichord music. You can see the harpsichord in front of the, the box. Uh, and other sound effects also, such as thunder. Now, uh, in exhibiting this invention, it's been suggested that Lutherborg was aiming to compete with some of the popular scientific shows running in London at the time, uh, including uh, the famous show of the notorious sex therapist James Graham uh, and uh, a similarly spectacular show by the so-called Prince of Puff, Gustavus Catafelto, if uh, that was indeed Lutherberg's intention, then Adam Walker, in effect, returned the compliment by appropriating some of Lutherberg's techniques for his own scientific display. The name was the most obvious borrowing. I do physicon, derives from the Greek for image or icon of nature. I duranion translates as image of the heavens. And like Lutherburg, Walker emphasized the name of his invention in large letters you know, on the posters advertising the, his show. <coughs> but in addition to the name, Walker also adopted some of Lutherburg's aesthetic effects. He used special lighting and parts moved by a hidden mechanism, evoking the contemporary fascination with mechanical automata. Walker's displays, like Lutherburg's, proceeded by exposing a series of discrete scenes, the curtains closed between each one and then parted to reveal the next. Walker, like Lutherburg, accompanied the display with harpsichord music played on a version of the instrument he called the Celestina, which he claimed to have invented. In later versions of the Idoranion, he introduced colored transparencies to project additional effects such as here, the signs of the zodiac, uh, which I think are projected onto a scrim or veil in front of the apparatus. Uh, and uh, the performance was also punctuated with uh, songs and hymns, uh, as uh, uh, with Lutherburg's mechanical interludes. This uh, is the second image of the Idoranion. This dates... Uh, Almost, certainly from the 1820s, uh, it's likely the new Theatre Royal Haymarket, which was opened in 1821. Uh, and this is uh, very likely David Franklin uh, Walker, uh, uh, who is uh, uh, showing the display there with appropriate gestures. These techniques contributed to the overall aesthetic effect of Walker's astronomical lectures. Lutherburg's Physicon was closely linked with the cultivation of the sublime, which was generally said to be evoked by the kind of phenomena he reproduced therein. Lutherburg was emphasizing thunder and lightning, moonlight, sunset, dramatic natural scenery, and so on. Uh, Lutherburg actually lost interest in his uh, invention in the mid-1780s and sold it to another uh, entertainer. Um, and Lutherburg then returned to work as an academic painter, producing biblical scenes and landscapes. Um, it, interestingly, his paintings shaped Walker's <coughs> own aesthetic perceptions, even of his native Lake District, um, in that narrative of his journey to the north in 1791 that I mentioned. Walker invoked Lutherburg as one of the artists whose renderings of the local scenery had captured its sublimity. With his Idoranion, Walker had done the same for astronomy. By tilting the plane of the orrery into the vertical and enlarging the apparatus, he had, in effect, opened a window onto the universe for a theatre audience, presenting them with the spectacle of the cosmic motions unencumbered by any visible machinery. The tabletop... <coughs> In order here. Thank you. 
Um, the tabletop orrery had tended to domesticate astronomy, uh, confining it to the limited compass of a room and emphasizing the order and regularity of the Newtonian clockwork. It did not readily convey the awesomeness of the cosmos at large. Walker had found a way to do this, which seemed to owe something to Lutherburg's theatrical flair. The fact that the source of, of the planetary motions was invisible, concealed in part by this gauze veil mounted in front of the moving globes, contributed to an uncanny eff effect associated with the sublime. The mystery <coughs> surrounding how the apparatus worked was part of its aesthetic effect, while its transparency allowed it to communicate the sublimity of the universe as a whole. Automatic motions, objects apparently suspended in space, dramatic colored lighting, and music, these were the techniques by which astronomy could be made into a sublime <coughs> spectacle. Now, the Ideranion served Walker and his family well for more than half a century. Uh, William Walker was already touring it around when he was only 16. Uh, Dean Franklin Walker uh, became a virtuoso performer with the apparatus and continued to display it in London theatres and in provincial locations through the late 1820s. The Ideranion achieved a secure place among the popular shows and spectacles of the period. The panoramas, dioramas, phantasmagorias, and other exhibits that proliferated especially in the capital. London at this time was obsessed with novel technologies for visual spectatorship. So much so that James Chandler and Kevin Gilmartin have called London the Ido Metropolis. So the Idoranion took advantage of this metropolitan fascination with spectacular display. As an adaptation of the theatre for the purposes of public education, it was said by one observer to have combined morality and information in a new kind of instructive entertainment, and by another to be among the most respectable efforts to extend the beneficial uses of the stage. Lutherberg, by contrast, had trod a much more precarious path to social respectability. As Ian McCalman has shown uh, in a series of articles, Lutherberg's career often teetered on the brink of disgrace. His charisma and rhetorical fluency, his fascination with alchemy and mesmerism, and his association with such notorious charlatans as the Count Cagliostro laid Lutherberg open to charges of quackery. Lutherberg's career shows how insecure the identity of such an artist and impresario might be. Walker, on the other hand, managed to anchor his social identity more securely and to pass on a respectable livelihood to his sons, notwithstanding his humble provincial origins and early associations with Priestley's radicalism. I think Walker's mobilization of the aesthetics of the sublime had played a significant part in this achievement. Uh, his son's advertisements promised that by means of the Idoronion, the sublime and awful simplicity of nature is daringly imitated. And there was a certain degree of daring to the performance and the content of the lectures. The invocation of the sublime alluded both to the technique of presentation and to what was described and it helped to contain some of the potentially disturbing implications of astronomical theory. To be specific, Walker and his sons laid out a cosmology in which each star was regarded as itself a sun, the center of its own solar system. The idea had something in common with Descartes' notion of multiple vortices, each star in the universe being surrounded by swirling matter carrying planets around it in a gigantic whirlpool. Walker explained that he was not endorsing the discredited Cartesian vortices, but instead envisioned the interstellar whirlpools as composed of light itself, which he identified with cosmic fire or phlogiston. This is uh, from Walker's System of Familiar Philosophy of 1799. 
As such, the conception could have had many sources in the 18th century, and Walker mentioned the works of the astronomer John Mitchell and the Durham cosmologist Thomas Wright. The daring came in when this cosmological vision was extended into a fully developed doctrine of the plurality of worlds. In other words, when the suggestion was made that each planet in each solar system could be inhabited. It was William Walker who laid this out most explicitly in his Epitome of Astronomy, as illustrated by the Iduranion, which went through at least 24 editions in its author's lifetime and was kept in print by his younger brother thereafter. Here, the Iduranion was used to introduce the possibility of life on other planets in this and other solar systems. For example, the planet Mercury, William Walker said, had without doubt inhabitants adapted to the heat of his situation. Uh, and Venus also, he suggested, provision has been made for inhabitants that they might not suffer by their vicinity to the sun. Mars, uh, well, uh, William Walker said, the warmer regions are of nearly the temperature of Russia. Uh, and the fact that William Herschel's recent discovery of the Georgian planet, or Uranus, had increased the possible abodes of life in the solar system. And similarly, beyond the solar system, innumerable stars must be supposed to be destined for the same noble purposes, viz. that of giving light, heat, and vegetation to various worlds that revolve around them. Now, this theme of the plurality of worlds was the subject of widespread speculation in this period, as Michael J. Crow and others have documented. William Herschel's speculations on the subject had emerged in a paper published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society in 1795, in which he proposed that the sun itself could be capable of supporting life in a cool interior. Earlier writings on the possibility of inhabited worlds by Bernard de Fontenelle, Thomas Wright, and Benjamin Parker of Derby were also well known. Such ideas were, however, theologically contentious. Wright had proposed that belief in celestial inhabitants was consistent with 18th century physico-theology, claiming that God's benevolence found its fullest expression in populating the entire universe. On the other hand, religious skeptics could draw on a tradition as old as Lucretius to argue that no divinity could be particularly concerned with the fate of one planet if so many millions of inhabited worlds existed. Seen in this way, the doctrine of plurality of worlds could be a weapon against Christian orthodoxy. Thomas Paine, in his Age of Reason of 1793, gleefully concluded that the idea of life elsewhere in the universe destroyed the basis of Christian faith Quote, and scatters it in the mind like feathers in the air. Percy Shelley was led to similar reflections by Adam Walker's lectures at Eton College and reached the same conclusion. To quote Shelley, the plurality of worlds, the indefinite immensity of the universe is a most awful subject of contemplation. He who rightly feels its mystery and grandeur is in no danger of seductions from the falsehood of religious systems. Now, that was not the conclusion to which Walker and his sons claimed they were leading their audiences. Rather, they invoked the category of the sublime to provide a reassuring and reconciliatory framework for the plurality of worlds idea. William Walker acknowledged that the notion of millions of suns nourishing their own worlds is infinitely too great for the human mind. Contemplating the prospect of inhabited planets extending throughout infinite space, the astonished fancy turns round and is entirely lost and sunk in the abyss of nature. But the bewildered imagination would, he said, ultimately be brought back to a realization of divine design, to the comforting reflection that a benevolent providence was regulating the entire system. The philosophic observer, Walker insisted, would conclude that the apparently disturbing and destructive powers are secondary and subservient, while those of the preserving and meliorating kind are primary, continued, and universal. 
There was therefore no reason for the mind to dwell on the melancholy and distressing aspects of the cosmic vision when a broader perspective would disclose the entire system of pure and perfect benevolence. So I think the uh, regular invocation of the sublime in connection with astronomical theory has this specific function of shielding the notion of the plurality of worlds from uh, uh, its identification with religious skepticism. By regularly reiterating the sublimity of their astronomical vision, Walker and his sons neutralized the existential terrors or atheistic implications that might otherwise accrue to these studies. They insisted on the edifying quality of astronomy, offering their audiences the reassurance of a providential order underlying the cosmic design. In this way, the motions of the bodies of the solar system, the orbits of comets, even the large-scale structure of the universe and the possibility of life on other planets became appropriate subjects for presentation to women and even children. A reviewer in 1798 commented on the suitability of the Iduranian lectures for those who would wish to see our morals improved by our amusements. In 1806, the Morning Post printed a poem by a female admirer of D.F. Walker who lauded his presentation of a spectacle that was glorious, sublime, and awful, and claimed that she, quote, heard the heavenly virtues speak in his voice. I'm not quoting the whole poem here, but these are a few lines. The novelist Thomas Love Peacock agreed that lectures with the Iduranians served to elevate the minds of all who witnessed them to sublime contemplations. Mariah Edgeworth's novel Frank of 1825 contains a scene in which two children attend an Iduranian lecture. They see the earth suspended in space, the moon reflecting the light of the sun, and the alignments of the three bodies that produce eclipses. Similar scenes could also be witnessed in middle-class homes by this time, thanks to the creativity of the publisher Thomas Elton, who produced a tabletop version of the transparent orrery in 1818. This is an example from the Yale Centre of British Art. Uh, and it is basically a, a box uh, with a uh, screen at the front, uh, which can be uh, changed by, uh, uh, can be rolled from a roller at the bottom to a roller at the top using the uh, little knobs on the side. Um, the device was explicitly modeled on the Iduranion and dedicated to D.F. Walker and his family in recognition of their work to popularize the sublime science of astronomy. The domestic version was inevitably less impressive than the theatrical one, the planets here do not rotate in their orbits and neither do uh, the moons go around the planets. Uh, what you have here is rather a series of scenes uh, which are presented one by one uh, to the viewer as you turn the handles. Uh, but you are supposed to uh, remove the back of the apparatus. This is um, the uh, inscription on the label in the back plate. You're meant to take out the back plate uh, and then uh, uh, place the device against the window or put a candle beside, behind it so that the light shines through and illuminates these uh, um, slightly uh, translucent uh, uh, scenes in the different uh, portions of the roll. Now, this version of the Iduranion might seem like a pretty poor imitation of the uh, theatrical version, but it belongs in a tradition of tabletop theatres, camera obscurers, and show boxes, which has been discussed by Barbara Stafford and others, which replicated in miniature the innovative theatrical displays of the time. Its production testifies to the cumulative impact of the Walker family's shows in London and elsewhere over more than four decades. Through their efforts, astronomy had come to be recognized as a sublime science, one that opened up the prospect of immense distances and times, gesturing at the profound emptiness that might or might not be seen as the domain of the Godhead. This had been accomplished by displaying a mechanical orrery 
deployed in a certain style of showmanship with an accompanying patter. Within a few decades, the spectacle and its rhetorical accomplishment have become cliches. Charles Dickens, in an issue of All the Year Round in 1863, satirized a child's response to such a spectacle. And I quote, All this time the gentleman with the wand was going on in the dark about a sphere revolving on its own axis 897,000 millions of times or miles in 263,524 millions of something else's until I thought, if this was a birthday, it were better never to have been born. Now, although it eventually became a target of satire in this way, when originally introduced, the Eideranion had been a startling novelty and an innovative tool of scientific enlightenment. I'm suggesting that Adam Walker's invention and the rhetorical framework in which it was deployed deserve to be recognized for the creative achievements they were and to be understood in the context that made them meaningful. They allowed Walker to negotiate the passage between priestly and provincial radicalism and metropolitan respectability. He was thereby able to maintain a program of scientific education aimed at public enlightenment in the face of the political reaction that spelled the end of the enlightenment as such. The Eidoranion gave him the means to secure a place amidst the theatrical shows and spectacles of Regency London, while also insinuating potentially disturbing, even subversive, ideas about life on other planets. I've suggested that the Eidoranion was the technological counterpart of a vocabulary of the sublime, an apparatus for communicating the noble and edifying spectacle of the universe to a theatre audience. It appropriated a series of technical innovations from other forms of mechanical display, including those of Lutherburg, who seems also to have suggested the device's name. Brilliant lighting, automatic movement, musical accompaniment, and the presentation of a series of discrete scenes were among the techniques used to appeal to viewers' sensibility and enhance their experience. What they experienced was understood in terms of the sublime, an emotional response that was construed physiologically but also ontologically as symptomatic of the human condition in the vastness of the cosmos. In some ways, the sublime functioned in the place of what Bruno Latour calls the crossed-out god of the modern world. It named the human response to powerful forces, huge distances, and vast expanses of time, which could be understood theistically, but did not have to be. Invoking the sublime was thus a way to negotiate such issues as the plurality of worlds with their unclear and hotly contested theological implications. Viewers could draw their own conclusions, as Shelley did, while the lecturers took cover behind a providential language that would reassure even a country vicar like Parson Woodford. The rhetoric was thus well adapted to mask the dislocations and ambiguity of, ambiguities of Walker's own career path, a path that took him from provincial obscurity as a self-taught assistant schoolmaster to a respectable and renowned place as a popular scientific educator in London. It was a path trodden with the aid of the remarkable contraption known as the Eideranian.